Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for a very kind uh, introduction. I'm a bit, uh, well, I want to uh, first of all thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to, for me to speak here. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to speak in front of all these participants from many countries. And I'm, I'm a little bit tense because, to be honest with you, that uh, this is my first time to speak before my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> As uh, introduced, uh, I have been, I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. I had worked for Japanese Foreign Service for about 41 years from um, uh, 1961 through 2002. And after retirement, I worked uh, in different capacities, but I participated in a number of uh, what we call the track two uh, dialogue, primarily on international security or strategic issues. And right in the middle of my, uh, this 55 years long career, Career, the Cold War was ended uh, by the so-called Malta Declaration uh, in 1989, uh, announced jointly by the President uh, George H. W. Bush and President Mikhail Gorbachev. Consequently, my, half of my career uh, was spent during the Cold War and there another half uh, in, the, uh, in the course of the evolutionary uh, glo evolutional globalization. So the, uh, uh, perhaps uh, looking around, I gather that the participants here do not at least remember. Uh, many might have been born after the end of the Cold War, but uh, many don't remember the experiences of the Cold War. So you might be wondering why I refer to the, the end of the Cold War. I refer to the end of the Cold War because this historic episode had brought into a sharp relief a difference between Asian Pacific and Euro-Atlantic geopolitical conditions. On the European side, or Euro-Atlantic side, the end of the Cold War had brought to an end the East-West military confrontation, which had lasted for around 44 years. Uh, if you count, uh, start talk about uh, the Cold War beginning at uh, the end of the, uh, the World War II. Also, uh, in the Cold War time, Soviet bloc, the end of the Cold War had resulted in replacing uh, the Communist Party's monopoly of power with democracy. The end of the Cold War, therefore, was regarded, uh, or even now is regarded as a watershed in the Euro-Atlantic uh, geopolitics. But the same was not true in Asia. In Asia, the end of the Cold War did not affect the Cold War time military confrontation on the Korean Peninsula and across the Taiwan Strait. Almost 30 years after the end of the Cold War, communist parties still remain in power in China, North Korea, Vietnam, and Laos. And uh, although I excluded Cambodia, but uh, I doubt uh, that uh, we can say the, the present regime or well, political system in Cambodia being uh, uh, democratic, fully democratic. So the, uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, geopol uh, the political changes did not take place in Asia uh, under the uh, influence of the end of the Cold War. In the worst, nuclear proliferation took place in India and Pakistan in the wake of the end of the Cold War. And North Korea's nuclear weapons development followed with the help of Pakistan. For the two years following 
coming back to the end of the Cold War, for the two years following the Malta declaration to end the Cold War, I had been in charge of the policy planning for the Japanese Foreign Service, Foreign Office, engaged in the so-called uh, policy planning talks with counterparts of around a dozen countries, included the United States, of course, because most frequently I, I met my counterpart in Washington. Uh, but also I started uh, first ever policy planning talks with Soviet Union and China. And uh, also I talked often with Britain, Germany, and France. I invited uh, South Korea uh, to join us in the trilateral policy planning talks with the United States. At that time, the South Korean foreign minister was make, creating the policy planning staff. And I also spoke with Indonesia and Singaporean counterparts, as well as Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand. And uh, these policy planning talks at that time were aimed at exploring future policy options through a free exchange of views on a non-committal basis and often free from each government's positions. This format was very, very useful at the time of historic transformation of international politics from the Cold War to an uncharted future then. In retrospect, uh, the experience of policy planning talks had brought home to me a stark, stark difference between the Euro-Atlantic and Asia, Asian geopolitics. I did not say Asian Pacific geopolitics this time because Australia, I found Australians, Canadians, Australians, and New Zealanders are thinking alike, the Europeans. Uh, but at that time, I hope they have become more Asia Pacific oriented. And uh, I think that uh, to be aware of this geopolitical difference between the two regions has become even more important now as the Asian Pacific region is in increasing its weight in world economy and politics. Seems that the uh, policy planning talks ha has g have gone out of fashion since then. But free exchange of views for similar purposes are now taking place at this kind of uh, occasions, what we call the, again track two or track one and a half dialogue organized by many think tanks. By track two, uh, uh, what is meant by track two is that participants are not government officials. And as you may know, the track one and a half. I think this uh, word was first coined by the Australians. Uh, they all, in the southern hemisphere, they want to always use something different. And uh, one and a half is now universally used uh, uh, means that the government officials are also participating in, private, in their private capacity. I regard the, uh, the development of this kind of format as advancement. For those uh, formats would involve people representing a broad spectrum of spectrum of opinions, particularly those of civil societies. Such a broadly inclusive format of discussion would be important at this time of change. This change is greater than uh, the, the changes which you are facing now, uh, would be greater than the end of the uh, Cold War on, on, the, on the new changes impact on the, on the future of the world. And uh, that said, today I want to discuss Asian security with a focus on three issues in order to provide a background for more focused debates in the sessions to follow. First, I want to talk about the strategic balance among the United States, China, Russia, and China. 
Second, I want to touch upon North Korea and South China Sea. And third, I want to talk about uh, the Japan-US alliance. I would not discuss terrorism. Indeed, terrorism is a growing cause of insecurity and instability in the Asian Pacific region, particularly in Southeast Asia. But, uh, but we can't, Japan won't uh, take it for granted that uh, this uh, terrorism will not reach us. But I will not discuss this issue, beca not because the issue is not important, but because the time is limited. Discussion on terrorism would require another full session. Well, before moving on, I want to qualify that the defense and security policy is a sort of necessary evil to be required in order to respond to the reality of the world. Indeed, the defense and security policy would not be productive for advancing toward a better world. I also have to add in this context that the so-called human security is different from military security in this context. Uh, because, as you know, that the efforts to enhance human security are productive for the sake of a better world. So in that, on that specific point, I think the human security is different from another military security. But when I was at the UN, I argued the defense on the very another point of protecting people or individuals, uh, even the defense or security policy uh, would be a part of the, uh, the steps to take for enhancing human security. But human security does have a more constructive or productive connotation. Now, uh, back to the strategic balance. Why strategic balance is important? It is because the strategic balance among major powers would set the tone of global security conditions. More than that, strategic uh, stability among the major powers would help create a political atmosphere uh, or even a common ground for, for the many countries, particularly for the major powers, to cooperate uh, for the sake of a better world. Now, put in historical perspective, the collapse collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of China have fundamentally transformed a structure of strategic balance in the world from the bipolar one between the United States and Soviet Union to a combination of three sets of bilateral strategic balance, the US-Russia, US-China, and Russia-China. Of these three sets of bilateral strategic relations, the one between the United States and China is an intrinsic part of the Asian Pacific geopolitics and would have defining impact on the region's security conditions. But the US, Russia, and China relations would also have significant implications for peace and stability in Asia. Alliance relations are also important in this context. Unlike Russia and China, the United States has the allies that not only benefit from the US-led strategic stability with Russia and China, but also share with Washington responsibility to ensure strategic stability if to limited and varying degrees. Here again though, alliance relations have been undergoing changes since the end of the Cold War. During the Cold War, the so-called solidarity among the West, so-called Western nations had been pursued in the US-led strategy against the Soviet Union. Then uh, the West included Japan, uh, which was a member of a group of advanced industrialized democracies called G7. It started as Z6 uh, when, uh, when the first meeting took place in Rambouillet, uh, Rambouillet in France, 
but uh, uh, the sec uh, Canada joined us uh, since the second time. Now, the, uh, even though Japan is a member of the West, but I, uh, we, the policy priority of the West had been always uh, given to NATO. I want to note in this context that uh, while the U.S.-Soviet mutual deterrence had prevented war in Europe, two hot wars, the Vietnam War and the, Viet I mean, the Korean War and the Vietnam War, were fought in Asia under the pressure of the Cold War. Well, since the end of the Cold War, however, the security interests of the United States allies have come to, have come to diverge too, particularly between those of the Asians and the Europeans. U.S. allies and partners in Asia are anxious about the Chinese political and military power and deplore North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile program development and worrying less about Russia, at least so far. By contrast, the European security con Euro Europeans' security concern seem to be focused on the resurgent Russia increased confusion of the Middle East and North Africa, and inflow of Muslim refugees, as well as homegrown terrorism. More worryingly, in the eyes of the Asians, or at least in my, in my eyes, the Europeans seem to, to be looking at China only through the economic lens. Of these three strategic relations, if we globally seen, the one between the United States and Russia is of central importance for global strategic balance as well as the, for the cause of nuclear arms reduction. Between them, between the United States and Russia, the two countries possess over 90% of the existing nuclear weapons, which are believed to be over 16,000 in total. By the way, the, the global nuclear weapons stockpile peaked in 1986 at the level of over 70,000. Now, seeing from Asia, the geopolitical implications of the U.S.-Russia strategic relations are now diminishing. During the Cold War, the U.S.-Soviet confrontation had defining impacts on global security, including Asian Pacific security. Mutual deterrence between the two camp, two nuclear superpowers had prevented war between the two camps, except for, I mean, the, it did not include the Korean War or Vietnam War, but between the two camps on the basis of so-called conceptualized prospect of mutual assured destruction. We call it MAD, mutual assured destruction. MSMAD, meaning that the two countries, the United States and Russia, Soviet Union, and later Russia, would totally destroy each other if they were to fight a war. But today, the US Russia strategic relation, relationship is far less relevant to Asia and Pacific security. Russians, Russia's political, let alone economic, profile in the region is low and overshadowed by China. Moscow, for its part, has been focusing on recovery of influence in the areas from Caucasus to the Baltic Sea or in the slightly broader areas which the Russians call near abroad. Russia is also trying to recover its influence in the Middle East particularly over the future of Syria. So bilaterally between the United States and Russia, nuclear weapons still uh, uh, continue to set the tone of strategic, strategic relations. The Americans might want to consider the logic of mutual Russian destruction is no longer tenable, but the Russians still regard MAD MAD as a basis for strategic stability with the United States. During, in the cold, few years ago, 
at the conference of the Global Zero, I heard Russian retired generals kept saying this point. And uh, to the Russians, particularly to President Putin, the perceived nuclear parity with the United States is vital to assure the country of a superpower status equal to the United States. More worryingly, Russia is engaged in developing development of new international intercontinental ballistic missiles with new multiple warheads, a new generation of nuclear submarines to carry new submarine-launched ballistic missiles, we call it SLBMs, and new shorter range missiles. Moscow tested a new land-based cruise missile in violation of the INF Treaty of 1997. The INF stands for Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, the terms used for US Soviet negotiations at the time. And the, IS, uh, the INF Treaty had banned the United States and the Soviet Union and its successor state, Russia, from possessing uh, ground-launched missiles with flying ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. Five thousand, uh, be above long, uh, the longer range uh, than 5,500 kilometers is regarded, uh, is used for the intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBM. So this INF, International Intermediate nuclear uh, forces uh, have ranges shorter than the ICBMs, longer than the so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Now some American uh, experts are worried. Well, I won't quote him, but there is a very prominent figure in his book that uh, Moscow might eventually withdraw from the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in order to test these new, four, new warheads uh, for new missiles, which they are now developing. This Russian policy sharply contrasts with the American one. Washington is refraining from developing new nuclear warheads and trying to maintain the effect of its nuclear deterrence by extending the life of existing nuclear arsenal. It is replacing ICBMs, multi multiple warheads with single ones. Furthermore, Washington is now trying to develop the so-called third offset strategy with the aim of staking a, staying ahead of Russia and China in employing innovative technologies and futuristic operational concepts for future non-nuclear warfare. This would serve the US policy of reducing the role of nuclear weapons in deterrence strategy. By the way, the, uh, I have not read much about this, uh, the third offset strategy in Japan, therefore I'll just explain to you that third offset stay strategy is said to follow the first, first one in the 1950s and the second one in the 1950s. 70s. The first offset strategy was designed to offset stronger Soviet conventional forces with the overwhelming U.S. nuclear weapons uh, built up under the President Eisenhower's New Look strategy. And the second one was aimed at attaining conventional super superiority over the strategically equal Soviet Union. Uh, with precision-guided weapon systems, stealth aircraft, and new intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance platforms. The effort, effect of weapon systems produced under the second offset strategy was dramatically demonstrated in the Desert Storm operation of 1991, which repulsed Iraqi forces which invaded Kuwait in the summer of 1990. It is not yet certain if 
or how the Trump, Trump administration would continue the third offset strategy. But given that, Russia and China are catching up with the United States in employing the already known advanced military technologies. It will be essential for Washington to continue to work on the innovation of non-nuclear military capabilities. Now on the question of nuclear weapon arms reduction, there has been no progress in efforts to follow up the so-called New START Treaty signed in 2010. START stands for Strategic Arms, Strategic Arms Reduction Talks. This, the New START Treaty limited the number of deployed strategic nuclear weapons of the United States and Russia to the level of 1,550 each. By the way, this is the seventh treaty of the kind signed by Washington and Moscow since 1972. The new start will remain in force until 2021, unless a new treaty would replace it earlier. And if agreed, the treaty could uh, also remain in, in force for another five years. Relationship between Washington and uh, Moscow, however, have been strained, particularly since Russia annexed, annexed Crimea in March 2014, so that there is little prospect for early resumption of arms control negotiation. But it should be in the interest of in political and financial interests of both Washington and Moscow to ensure strategic stability between the two countries at lower levels of nuclear force balance. Such efforts are also essential to meet for the two countries to meet uh, the obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty called the NPT, and more politically importantly, or strategically importantly, uh, to eventually entice China to join their efforts U.S. Russia, uh, Russia efforts for nuclear weapons reductions. I therefore consider uh, that the two countries would eventually resume negotiations on the treaty to follow the new start. Russia's increased re reliance on nuclear forces appears uh, to be reflecting its concerns about the progress of modernization and expansion of Chinese uh, nuclear and other forces. Geopolitically, too, the, Ru the Russians are worried, concerned about expanding Chinese influence in the Central Asia, which they still regard as part of the country's sphere of in influence. They are also wary of the vulnerability of Far Eastern Siberia and the Far East to Chinese influence. In these regions, which are far away from the European part of Russia and bordering on much populous Chinese provinces, the Russian population is diminishing and local economies are struggling. There is good reason, therefore, for President Putin to wish to get Japanese cooperation for economic development in these regions. Despite these differences, both between the two countries, both Russia and China have a common interest in undercutting the United States position as the sole superpower. Therefore, a possibility remains that the two countries might support each other in their strategic contest with the United States. Against this backdrop, for Japan to cooperate with Russia for the economic development of Russia's eastern regions, and also for improving Russia's socioeconomic weakness, such as medical systems, would help Moscow in diversifying external source of cooperation. As you might have been reading, the Japan, for its part, hopes that such Japanese cooperation would eventually be conducive to recovery of the Northern Territories. 
The so-called Northern Territories are the four Japanese islands which have been placed under Russian control ever since the Soviet forces occupied them in the final days of World War II. But it, of course, it remains yet to be seen if Japan's economic co cooperation for Russia would work to change Moscow's hitherto adamant attitude toward the territorial dispute with Japan. Now, uh, let me turn to the US-China strategic relations, which are very complex and still evolving. To the United States, and also, of course, to Japan and many other nations, many Asian nations as well, China is an important partner for trade and economy, as well as for diplomacy. China, too, needs stable external relations with the United States and other countries in order to cope with many difficult problems at home. Yet, China has been engaged in military expansions for more than two decades. Beijing's current strategy, which the Americans called anti-access, anti-denial, they call it A2AD, A2-AD, seems to be aimed at denying U.S. forces access to the areas essential to protect what Beijing regards as a country's core interest, like Taiwan. To this end, Beijing initially sought to equip itself with an asymmetrical force posture, with particular fo focus on space and cyber. But now, it is expanding military power in all aspects, including nuclear forces. China is said to have shown little interest in strategic dialogue with the United States. Perhaps because uh, nuclear ba force balance is not of central importance for the US-China relations, at least so far. Beijing also avoids transparency as part of its own strategy. More importantly, the Chinese leaders seem to be trying to further strengthen the country's military power before explore, exploring a type of strategic relationship they want with Washington. In his first meeting with President Barack Obama in 2013, President Xi Jinping made a proposal to build a new model of major countries' uh, relationship. He also stated earlier that the vast Pacific Ocean had enough space for the two large countries of China and the United States. But these statements are too broad to indicate or for us to detect what China would want in its strategic relations with the United States and with the rest. Furthermore, the Chinese appear, uh, appear to believe that time is on their side in, comp in comp competition with the United States, a perception reportedly held by them, by the Chinese, that the United States is a declining power. Uh, I think it's groundless. But it is true that the United States has been preoccupied with many other more pressing issues other than China. On top of it, the Obama administration's cautious approach toward military involvement overseas has emboldened China and also other opponents as well. More fundamentally, the Chinese are thinking to eventually become the number one country in the world. In the, in the light of the, the country, China's history, such a way of thinking is not far-fetched. This Chinese logic would not be manifested in Beijing's near-term strategy, but it would certainly be underlying the Chinese approach toward the strategic relations with the United States or toward the outside world as a whole. In a long-term perspective, the Chinese pursuit of primacy might pose an unprecedented challenge to the Americans whose national creed is also 
remained strongest in the world. The U.S.-China context for primacy would be further compounded by the difference in the time span that frames the two countries' strategy. As you know, the Chinese strategic approach is based upon a much longer perspective than the Americans. Americans one, American approach is always defined in every four years. All in all, the U.S.-China strategic relationship would be formed in a bottom-up and multifaceted way, building upon what would take place between the two countries in many policy areas. Such policy areas range from, for example, the making of financial in institutions and trade pacts to cooperation within uh, Asian, a competition of, in cooperation with Asian countries, and also to propagation, pro propagation of the rules-based international order and universal values. Military balance would be crucial for strategic balance between the two countries, but it would only be part of a complex equation that would define the U.S.-China strategic balance. Now, against this backdrop of changing strategic balance, North Korea is posing an immediate threat to Asian security, particularly to South Korea and Japan and uh, U.S. forces deployed in the two countries. A nuclear-free nuclear Korean Peninsula is a goal once agree agreed by the parties of the six-party talks, including North Korea. But given the progress of North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile development, how to deter North Korean aggression is an immediate task for South Korea, Japan, and the United States. Cooperation among the three countries to the end is in progress. Japan and the United States have been cooperating to develop an advanced interceptor for ballistic missile defense. Seoul has agreed to deployment of the US ballistic missile defense system called DART. It stands for Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. And most recently, Japan and South Korea concluded an agreement on the security of military intelligence, which would facilitate the exchanges of military information between the two countries. To further improve defense against North Korea, planning for defense of South Korea and, Jap and defense of, J of Japan should be made to support each other other, more closely than before. In the past, uh, for U.S. forces to use bases in Japan for defense of South Korea was Washington's primary interest in the Japan-U.S. security arrangements. But now that Japan is within the range of North Korean missiles, defense of Japan and U.S. forces therein would no longer be separable from uh, that defense of South Korea. It is therefore important to ensure that the U.S.-South Korea alliance and, and U.S.-Japan alliance would support each other in deterring North Korea. Of course, we have to admit that uh, defense cooperation with Japan remains a politically sensitive issue in Seoul. A strong anti-Japanese sentiment persists in South Korea. While it is very important for Japan to realize or understand this reality, I hope that South Korean government would act pragmatically on defense issues. Well, diplomatically, it is evident that China, with a strong influence on Pyongyang, among others, should do more to dissuade North Korea from nuclear weapons development. Without more earnest cooperation from China, the UN Security Council's sanctions against North Korea would not work effectively. Now, in the South China Sea, China has been enforcing its territorial claims by creating artificial islands by reclamation and defying the ruling 
by an international trade tribunal in The Hague. Strategically, from their point of view, I think that these Chinese actions are aimed at bolstering its their A280 strategy by expanding a zone of unfettered operations of the Chinese People's Army. Well, by the way, although it's called Army, but it has Navy and Air Force. And the, the ASEAN countries, however, have failed to stand together against the Chinese actions, despite the international tribunals ruling favorable for the Philippines. There seems to be a combination of reasons for this. For example, the ASEAN countries' propensities to avoid direct confrontation with neighboring China or with any other major powers. Their needs for also their needs for economic relations with China, including development assistance from it. And also the so-called ASEAN way of seeking consensus over the issues of common interest and concern. Additionally, Beijing pointedly avoids meddling in the other countries' domestic affairs, particularly over the politically sensitive issues of democracy or human rights. Accordingly, the ASEAN countries' recent approach toward China uh, should be regarded as part of their balancing act rather than the, their strategic tilt uh, toward China. These recent actions include uh, the decision by the Philippine president to give priority to his country's fishing boats access to the Scarborough Shore over uh, the territorial claim over it and by the Malaysia, Malaysian Prime Minister to buy patrol boats from China. But they are, the, uh, in my eyes, they are simply a balancing act instead of uh, a strategic tool toward China. Notwithstanding these uh, approaches or ASEAN countries' approaches toward China, it is important for Japan to keep stressing the importance of the rules-based international order and the freedom of navigation and flight in particular, as well as democracy and human rights. For these principles and values would serve the interests of ASEAN countries, if not now, but in the future. Now I want to add here that Japan would have a unique role to play in relations with the ASEAN countries. Japan has been building cooperative partnerships with Southeast Asian countries ever since uh, the US forces withdraw from the region in the wake of the Vietnam War. US forces had to withdraw even from its ally, Philippines, a quarter of a century ago, although now they have now regained access to bases in the Philippines. Japan has been cooperating with ASEAN countries for their economic development ever since, I would say, from the 1980s or even before, and more strategically since the late 1970s, according to the so-called Fukuda Doctrine, which was named after the then Japanese Prime Minister uh, Takeo Fukuda. In a speech at Manila in 1977, that year is the 10th anniversary of the creation of ASEAN. Prime Minister Fukuda committed to promote cooperation with not only with ASEAN countries of that time, but also with the rest of Southeast Asian countries. <coughs> Most importantly, Mr. Fukuda stressed the importance of building up what they called, at that time it's called heart-to-heart -heart, uh, relationship with Southeast Asian countries. These key words are still remembered in Southeast Asia, particularly by uh, uh, perhaps uh, elderly or older generations. Japan's cooperation with ASEAN countries has since shifted its focus from economic assistance to investment and trade, and gradually expanded to include 
capacity building in the areas of police, Coast Guard, and uh, to a very limited extent, but uh, to the defense. What defense equipment, I should say. It is expected, next year is the 50th anniversary of the creation of the ASEAN. And uh, it is expected uh, that this uh, occasion or this juncture would yet, would add yet another momentum to Japan's cooperation with the ASEAN countries. Finally, I want to discuss Japan-US alliance. As I said at the beginning, US allies' security interests and concern now vary with the region. Among them, Japan stands at a unique position. For Tokyo shared with Washington sec security con concerns about potential threats of Russia and China, as well as those about North Korea's nuclear weapons and missile development. South Korea, another US ally in Northeast Asia, is arguably uh, focused primarily on the threat from the North. Australia is another important US ally in this region, but situated in the Southern Hemisphere. Australia does not rely on the US extended deterrence as much as Japan. Now, Japan-US security treaty is essential not only for the defense of Japan, but also for the defense of South Korea and the security of the ASEAN countries. The forward deployment of U.S. forces in Japan and Japan's host nation support for U.S. force presence, as well as Japan's self-defense forces increased cooperation with U.S. forces are together critically important for U.S. force presence and power projection in the Asian Pacific region and beyond. It has been widely regarded that U.S. force presence in the region is indispensable for regional stability. Japan's host nation support, which amounts to around uh, for fiscal year 2016, it amounts to about US dollars, 5.2 billion dollars, if uh, at the exchange rates of the one dollar for 505, 105 yen, is known to be most cooperative among the US allies globally. On defense cooperation, the guidelines for defense, Japan-U.S. defense cooperation agreed in 2015 spelled out two countries' role in mutual cooperation for Japan's security as well as for peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. The United States, for, for its part, has committed to extend deterrence to Japan through the full range of capabilities, including U.S. nuclear forces. Japan has committed to support U.S. forces in responding to arms attack in the region on the United States or the third country like South Korea. Japan's military co uh, cooperation would be limited to such operations as ballistic missile defense, maritime operations, search and rescue, asset protection, and logistic support. But this new commitment signifies an epoch-making shift in Japan's policy from the long-held one of totally denying itself the exercise of the right of collective self-defense. In the meantime, Japan is at the forefront of a new contingencies, which both Tokyo and Washington call, now call the gray zone contingencies. Gray zone what is main, meant by gray zone is a state which is neither war nor peace. China almost constantly dispatches naval and coast guard vessels as well as fishing boats to the areas around the Senkaku Islands, which China calls Dao Yu Dao, if my pronunciation is correct, with the aim of physically challenging the Japanese control of the islands. Japan's Coast, Guards, uh, Coast Guard vessels have been foiling uh, the Chinese attempt. To engage Coast Guard vessels is the key uh, to confine the issue within the realm of law, en law enforcement and to prevent its escalation to war. But in order to make the operation, 
operations effective, it is vital to ensure uh, that Coast Guard operations would be backed up by the self-defense forces and as necessary by Japan-US defense cooperation, which would ultimately be linked to the US nuclear umbrella. This would em uh, entail expanding the concept of US extend extended deterrence to deterring uh, the gray zone contingencies. Two important steps were already taken to this end. Washington has repeatedly affirmed that the Japan-US Security Treaty covers the Senkaku Islands, signifying Washington's recognition of Japan's control of the islands, and the 2015 guidelines for defense cooperation stated that the two governments would take measures to ensure Japan's peace and security, I quote them, in all phases, seamlessly, uh, from peacetime to contingencies, unquote. This seamless cooperation from peacetime to contingency is critically important to ensure that the Japan US security cooperation would cover gray zone contingency. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the very important fact that despite Pyongyang's accelerated drive to develop nuclear weapons, Japan remains committed to non-nuclear policy. Japan's three non-nuclear principles of not possessing, not producing, not permitting entry into the country of nuclear weapons is an embodiment of Japanese people's strong anti-nuclear weapon sentiment. To deter uh, nuclear threats, therefore, Japan uh, has since long opted to depend upon the U.S. extent deterrence. It is well known that Japan is equipped with technological and financial capabilities to, be, to produce nuclear weapons. Some foreign pundits have argued that Japan might go nuclear if North Korea would possess nuclear weapons. But as you see it now, they have been proved wrong. Instead of moving in the direction of possessing an independent nuclear deterrence, Japan has moved further to strengthen defense cooperation with the United States in order to enhance the credibility of the U.S. extended deterrence, including nuclear umbrella. I believe that the Japan's firm commitment to non-nuclear policy is by itself a sig significant contribution to the cause of nuclear non-proliferation. I want to conclude uh, by stressing again uh, that security policy is a, a necessary response to the reality of the world, but that uh, sec security policy or defense policy are not productive for the cause of ensuring a better world. What is most required at this time of change is for countries and peoples in the world to cooperate to overcome challenges. Between Japan and China, for example, there are many issues on which the two countries can cooperate. Most symbolically, a well-known, such as climate change or uh, aging society, we share uh, the common concern and we have to cope with common challenges. This is a non-traditional security issues, perhaps. And uh, the, the same can be said globally, not, uh, not only between Japan and China, but with other countries. To deepen mutual understanding between the peoples concerned is therefore the key to make such positive cooperation uh, successful. This, ki this kind of conference is uh, very important in this context. I will therefore uh, wish you all participants the success of the gathering, and I want to thank again the organizers uh, for their initiative uh, to hold this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.